Earlier in the day, there was a dramatic confrontation between Chinese government officials and leaders of the student hunger strike. It was shown on government-run television. Meeting in the Great Hall of the People, Premier Li Peng declared, the social order of Beijing is in chaos. It may spread to other parts of the country. Beijing has fallen into a state of anarchy. The government, he warned, cannot ignore this phenomenon. One of the student leaders who has been on the hunger strikes since Saturday and is being given medical treatment was Wu Kaishi, a 21-year-old from Beijing Normal University. He accused the leaders of showing no sincerity in solving the problem. It is not necessary, he said, for us to talk with you anymore. Soon after that, he collapsed and was taken to the hospital. Tell us, tell us more about what time of day was that? That was early morning, it looks like. Do I have uh, how many minutes? 
<laughs> I was going to start start the stopwatch, you know? Well, four or five minutes. <laughs> four or five minutes okay. It's kind of surreal to see myself uh, 30 years back. Now you, you all know how old I am. I was <laughs> 20 back then. Uh, and it took me that long to grow this hair. Um, it's very saddening to somebody like me to be here talking about it, uh, still worried about, not just about China, but I'm all, instead of worrying about more massacres in China, I'm more worried about the massacres here. <laughs> and my daughter being shot in the school, uh, and my black musician friends being shot by the police. But well, let's go back to China back then. Uh, you heard what Zhou Fengshuo was saying, that was a festival of freedom. Uh, to me, I will always remember Tiananmen, Liu Si, as we call it, June 4th, as China's Woodstock being crushed by tanks. Uh, China's Woodstock without the mud, but plenty of blood. Uh, we, it was, uh, very romantic movement, full of romances as well. Uh, you, you saw how I was dressed back then. We, we really treated it like a rock concert, even though very few of us have been to have been to our rock concerts. Um, and uh, there were so many nameless people who are, are never photographed or filmed, who died for nothing, uh, who were jailed for nothing, and um, the sadness, the irony of it all, uh, it, it is, it's really hard to describe. Uh, and for a nation, we're talking about, the journalists were talking about amnesia. And I hate to remind you guys about the amnesia in the United States. And I don't want to say more about that or, or know what it's about. Uh, the truth is so uh, how can I say, so inconvenient for those who are in power uh, in every country, really. And uh, the truth, I was looking at uh, uh, the records of the Holocaust. Uh, the Holocaust uh, started in 1933, right? Uh, still, <laughs> there's so many de uh, Holocaust deniers and their court cases, even in California, suing the deniers. And this is happening in the United States. Uh, and uh, talking about the amnesia, and uh, I don't know about them, I five years ago, I uh, procrastinated for 25 years, and finally I broke down in front of my therapist who diagnosed me for having P uh, PTSD, and I had to even Google what it is about. <laughs> and for myself, I wanted to forget it. I wanted to bury all that memory. It's just too painful to remember. And it, it pisses me off. Sorry, folks. It, it makes me angry that uh, the consensus these days, quoted by many, many uh, inter international media outlets, the gratefulness, the gratitude the Chinese should have for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, talking about, uh, it's, it's quoted too many times uh, that uh, the Chinese Communist Party has lifted millions of people, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Hey, it's not them. We don't need to thank the torturers, uh, the thugs who deprived us of that freedom, the basic freedom of making a good living. It's the Chinese people, the people in China, Chinese occupied countries that worked hard to make it happen. And uh, I, I remember every time when I went back to China as a reporter, I was astounded. Uh, I'm talking about like in the far corners near the Three Gorges and the hot pot restaurant I was by myself. And the woman who was running that food stall asked me all of a sudden what happened in June 4th in Beijing. We're talking about 10 years later when I was there. Uh, because she said uh, uh, she wanted to know. She recognized I was somebody from overseas. And answering questions about if uh, our, where our answers are our, 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 appeal, uh, our uh, pleas uh, are answered or responded in China, 
uh, people here, Zhou Fengso, Kai Xi, and I, we have been in touch with activists and dissidents in China almost on a daily basis. And uh, very, very frequently, I'm approached by young Chinese inside China on Twitter. Usually, they get over the firewall on Twitter and ask me about it. Sometimes I have to ignore them because I'm too busy and there's too many requests. I, mean, I get requests from high school students in, in the States who drove for six hours in deep snow to interview me because they want to know the history. And I don't want to uh, yes, that's occupy that's, too that's, many that's minutes. Me. Sorry. Um, what I wanted to say here is that uh, we can talk a lot about past. Right now is a very dangerous and exciting time. Turning corner uh, landmark of world history. Uh, and thanks to the rise, I say thanks in a very uh, sarcastic way, of course, to the right wing, the rise of the right wing politics, white supremacy, and more dictators like that orange third. I don't want to say his name. I, I really, really don't want to say that name. Is that the grassroots movements around the world are linking up? And we, we see the brave uh, Hong Kong Democrats and the journalists here, the Tibetan activists here, the Uyghur activists here, and the many Americans and Singaporeans. There, the fact that this event is sold out is quite a statement, and I was astounded. Uh, and uh, for us to talk about Tiananmen now means a lot more, a lot more to Americans. That's why the Americans who really want to know and approach us, uh, approach us a lot more now. And another thing is that I'd like to remind the journalists and uh, the world media uh, have been on decline since I took the journalism course <laughs> in Sydney in 1993. <laughs> it's been uh, going down a hill. I can't remember how many times I've been laid off and ironically laid off by CNN. <laughs> um, it's very visually traumatizing for the international media outlets, including the most notable institutions, the big institutions, to publish a lot of statements and uh, whatever garbage said by those garbage politicians, including our orange turd, and having his photo and those right-wingers, the white supremacists' photos splashed all over the front pages, everywhere, and I and many of my American friends or international friends, we made, made a rule. If there's a headline photo of the orange turd or any of those, I call them the fuglies, the uglies, the F word and uglies, uh, we refuse to share them. So please take note because the mainstream media rely on social media activists like us to share your stories around. <laughs> if you keep publishing those fuglies photos around, we refuse to share that because the current stage is traumatizing enough, enough for everybody, including kids. Kids are getting depressed. We're talking about 10 year olds well, getting anxiety. Well, and, yeah, so anyway, let me wrap up. So please uh, and uh, listen to us, the survivors' tales, and think about what's happening to you and to the United States right now. Thank you. Poor Kashi, tell us about what happened to you back then. and. Why, would, why were you so angry at the, at the Prime Minister? Yes, uh, uh, first let me thank uh, Overseas Press Club for providing this wonderful opportunity to uh, to talk to you too. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the lunch uh, panel that I hear, about, I saw a lot of uh, familiar faces that I saw back in Tiananmen Square. And now I look at the audience, I will still see many familiar faces, uh, good friends, heroes. It's, uh, I would like to first begin with recognizing someone Zheng Xiuo, better. He, he was here, but then maybe Dr. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> probably yes. Uh, uh, he just left China about six months ago, and then I saw him a couple of days when I just came to New York. Uh, um, and he was a good friend of mine back in Tiananmen Square, and he was listed number nine on the Chinese government's most wanted list. Tell us about that. Is there is there really such a thing a most wanted list? How do you how do you know about that? Well, they made sure that we know it. It's quite uh, overwhelmingly like uh, we clearly broadcasted. 
I think like on the on, on the electronic media like radio or TV, uh, it's repeated at almost every hour. And then the posters of you know twenty one of us, including here Joe Hongzhou and my ugly face on it, and it's everywhere. I was trying to skip from skip from. So the twenty one people and survivors that the Chinese government broadcast their presence and their pictures trying to harass you, or they try, trying to kidnap you. What are they? What are they trying to achieve? Arrest. And then Zhou Hongzhou is the first person of uh, the twenty one of us to, to get arrested. Right, sitting right here. And then, uh, so yes, most wanted. Um, one of the greatest honor that I, in my life, being most wanted by the Chinese government. <laughs> Number two, and then even you know, pretty good ranking. And then uh, <laughs> I think after Wang Dan got uh, arrested, hey, I bumped into number one. <laughs> and then 30 years is a long time. And then, uh, well, that earlier video clips kind of demonstrates that. And then every year we come to the June Force, we I used we repeat that phrases time flies but well and then I have a facial hair and the big belly to prove that in Canada. <laughs> and <laughs> but, um, it's a it's a long time we are really worried that 30 years is too long for people to keep remembering and then remembrance is its form of uh, resistance even maybe one of the most humble way uh, to resist, uh, uh, but remembering is important, and I want to take uh, this opportunity to express my gratitude to the colleagues in the media who are sitting in a perfect, uh, you know, setting and location, overseas press clubs, and a lot of you helped us to remember, helped the world to remember, helped. Uh, this is a this is an uphill battle because one of the most powerful government is fighting really hard to make sure people to forget. So uh, this war is, continue, is continuing. I remember back in 1989, so uh, so many experts here, and then they're really not, there's no necessity for me to, to tell, like make a political analogy here. Uh, we all know what's going on. And then, but let me tell you some like a personal account. Uh, when I was in, in the movement, uh, one day I was contacted by a journalist that wants to interview me. That, at that time, a lot of journalists interviewed me. But this pair of journalists, they are very special. They're from Chinese Youth Daily, Chinese Youth Daily. It's the, uh, it's the propaganda piece of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, youth, uh, Communist Youth League, the, uh, you know, uh, the pair organization for the younger generation in, in China. Well, basically, they're communists. They're the, the mouthpiece of the communists. And two journalists came to me and said, want to interview. And I said, well, you're not going to publish anything. Why do you want to interview? And then they say, you know, they probably won't publish it. And then we appreciate what you are doing here and fighting for the freedom. And especially one of the most important slogan, one of the most important demand of the 1989 student war, press freedom. So he says, you know, at least being a journalist, I need, we two of us need to do our job to conduct this interview as submitted. And probably will never get printed. So uh, I think it was one of the most touching, well, and then it was certainly the one that I remembered clearly, one interview that I conducted for no hope of being broadcast. So, uh, so that, but that tells us, and now to, nowadays I work closely with Reporter Without Borders uh, in Asia and trying to, you know, and, and then we just released our index uh, for 2019. Uh, uh, China is ranked among 180 countries, uh, 176. <clears throat> uh, I live in Taiwan now. I want to gladly report that Taiwan is, is in a good shape. Better. It, was, it has always been like a, a, a number one in Asia. This year we got surpassed by Korea. They're, they're also doing a good job. We ranked 41 and 42. Uh, 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 40 and 41, sorry. Korea 40 and uh, Taiwan 41. United States 42. So we do we did a better job than the United States. In Tiananmen, we fought for democracy. And one of the questions I was asked the most is, what do you guys know about democracy? You never lived in democracy. You know, that is true. It caught me there. You know, we never lived in democracy. But how come we fight for democracy? Well, because we have a damn good knowledge of what lacking of democracy. 
that has uh, has put uh, ideas in a perspective. And then the word democracy. Well, what you're saying was the primary intellectual uh, funnel, or the in in intellectual responsibility for the, the, the first uh, desire for democracy was the, the presence of the Western media, was the presence of what 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 was the intellectual spark that sparked all of you? The word democracy is not denied in China. They just put an adjective before that. It's called people's <laughs> dicta dictatorship democracy. No, people's uh, uh, democratic dictatorship. No, no. Or I mean, one way or another. It just and then, uh, uh, the, but as I was saying, like, and then the mean the word democracy in Chinese is minzhu. Its transliteration back into English is people rule. People take part in, and then it's not that it's not really a hard concept, even for a country that has no democracy whatsoever. But, but we, the Communist Party, couldn't deny the value of democracy. They just want to want us to divert the attention of the, the idea of taking part in. And then the, in, in the whole eighties, the country had moved forward under the slogan that of the great architect of the new era, Deng Xiaoping open and reform. The 1989 students who are not, the student movement were not aimed to overthrow the government, not, not even aimed to overthrow the communist, uh, communist party ruling. In fact, in the, the May 4th, uh, 70 years anniversary march, which I was the general commander in that one, we decided the, 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 the slogan of, the, uh, of that march includes long live communist party. You know, it's not like we love the Communist Party so much we want them to long live. It's we want to establish our stance. We are not here to be your enemy. We want to hold you, hold yourself accountable for your promises to Chinese people. Open and reform. That's your slogan. Do just that, but not just on economics uh, spectrum, but also we need our rights. We want. You know, I was uh, often quoted by one of the interviews that I gave. I believe it was an associate play press and says, work as she says, uh, he wants a uh, uh, Nike shoes and bring his girlfriends to uh, to the bar. This is one of the often quoted uh, interview that I've given. Yes, we want that. We also want to take part in of decision making process. In the state. we want to do, we want much more than just that, and we want political rights to guarantee we can have the access of those things, the material things. And, and <laughs> one thing the, the Chinese people are really afraid of is loose, is, is chaos. I mean, Chinese people well, went through cultural revolution, uh, histor hysterically afraid of the country sinking into chaos. I use the word, I use the term hysteric, hysteric. It means it's it's not it's a, it's a psychiatric term. It basically means it's it's ill thinking. It's one of the but Chinese people are just like that. And then Communist Party have been able to carry through their ruling by blaming by saying if you if you have democracy, you're gonna lose that. You're gonna lose your stability. In the matter of fact, democracy brings stability. And I live where I live in Taiwan. I can use Taiwan to prove that it's democracy is very noisy. That's for sure. <laughs> but it's not. It wouldn't bring chaos. Chinese Communist Party bring chaos. Chinese uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party bring social unease. Social and then some people often say, you know, let's look at uh, the great uh, achievement the Communist Party have done in the last thirty years after cracking down the, the Tiananmen student movement. So it's, it's like a, they have to be credited for the economic growth. And let's look at what they did in the last 30 years to, to deserve this credit. What they did is to remove all the controls that Communist Party previously have established in China. So before, come, before Deng Xiaoping come to power, Communist Party almost choked China to death, and then they decided to ease their hand a little bit. So we're no longer choked to death. We're, we can breathe now. And then now we, are, we should be grateful to the hand that choked us in the first place, and now it is not choking us anymore. And then why am I, 
why do we hear similar arguments from the West too? Why we are so over complimenting to the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese regime? You know, we Chinese uh, have a good, uh, well, when I say we Chinese, it's kind of funny. I'm Uyghur. I'm, I am, uh, I'm, I'm a Uyghur. But I, let me put it this way. I was, uh, I'm a Uyghur by blood. My parents are Uyghur. I'm, I'm a Uyghur. Uh, but, but I'm Chinese by birth. I was born and raised in Beijing as a uh, citizen of the People's Republic of China. And then I'm a proud participant of the Chinese democracy movement. I, I call myself Chinese democracy activist. In that sense, of course, I'm Chinese. Well, and then I'm happy now by choice. I'm a Taiwanese too. Yes. So, let's go and get a few comments in here. So, are you finished with your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, I guess. No. <laughs> let's, let's, let's just go get in. We're running out, we're in short on time. So, Zhou so Hongzhou uh, was uh, in Tiananmen and saved Feng Gong. Uh, who was not able to be here today with us from San Francisco, but you know about his story. So you're going to tell us a little bit about that story of you helping to pull him out of the square and then tell us about what you were doing at, at that time. Is it live? Okay. No. Okay. Right, so it's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, uh, I just. Uh, I was so uh, inspired by the first panel. You know, the journalists, the journalists uh, were a big part since 1989, and uh, do the protest after the massacre, and they been keeping the memory alive for the last 30 years. Uh, they come up with uh, my uh, deep uh, respect. You know, in, in today, if I look at all the professions in the United States, journalists. Deserves the best. Uh, I think uh, when I uh, watch the movie um, Spotlight, you know, I think that's that's what reflects in this country. Journalists do the work uh, despite all the systematic problems in the country. Uh, in the uh, in 1989, press freedom was one of the top uh, demands of students. Actually, if you're sure if from students, this was probably the only demand uh, at that time. I, I still remember even when I led the students out of uh, Tsinghua University, we were changing press freedom and democracy. And that the, uh, there were people trying to cheer us. They just wouldn't understand. So, well, if you say something about corruption and inflation, we would uh, applaud you more. So later we, we, we change. So we start with end of corruption. And uh, uh, after we uh, came back and said, okay, let's read some some flares on why price freedom <coughs> is important for uh, keeping the corruption on, on control. So, uh, so uh, even in uh, on April uh, 18, you know, three days into it, after we are one step to a petition of seven demands, and the most important one is press freedom. And also, uh, journalists uh, in China uh, play a big part in it. Can uh, she talk about it? I remember, uh, now I looking back, I just realized this year, I was probably the first one to offer uh, Flowers to Huiyaobang and People's Monument uh, the next day uh, because going out of campus to do its big deal. And uh, uh, what's, what makes it significant is the next day, my words were printed on the uh, official newspaper. Uh, and uh, uh, this year, Chen Xiaoya, uh, who is uh, one of the best historians on this, she found that newspaper. And, uh, so that was, to me, that was uh, galvanizing. I realized you know, I can push for change. You know, there will be a people you know, influenced by this. And uh, so uh, this, this is very important. And even um, in May, there was a protest purely exclusively by the journalists. Uh, we were there just to support them. And over a thousand journalists sent a petition demanding press freedom. And because the students were demanding dialogue, uh, 
on you know, the seventh petition, uh, the seventh demands petition, the, the uh, journalists were demanding a dialogue with the uh, party leadership <coughs> on press freedom at about the same time. So uh, while I was uh, on Tiananmen Square, I was uh, responsible for building this uh, uh, voice of the students' movement. So, uh, and there will be people coming to us uh, with all kinds of uh, requests, and a lot of them you know, would bring uh, you know, um, voice clips, the recorded or the broadcast there. The, what the uh, just uh, the official you know, journalists and the governments, but the, the government outlets, they not allowed to do it. So they would come to us to broadcast. And they say, you know, we, we do something official, but now we do something real, something true. So that's that's. The, so come back to the story of Hong Kong. And yeah. What happened? Yeah. Uh, sorry uh, about Fang Zhen. Um, so I didn't uh, see Fang Zhen on Tiananmen Square. What I did, I think, uh, is through humanitarian China, this uh, organization we founded in. Uh, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, we brought his family uh, here to the United States. Uh, so uh, he is able to live uh, here uh, and uh, um, testify on the event. What's important about Fountain's story is that, uh, let me tell his story first. So uh, the students were leaving Tiananmen Square. This is the after the uh, Conquering troops occupied Tiananmen Square. So they already had the control. The students were leaving, going west toward campus on Tiananmen Street. And uh, there were uh, probably three tanks going out of Tiananmen Square, chasing the students from behind. From behind. And uh, started with the poison gas. So a female student who was with Fang Zheng at that time fainted due to the pouring the gas. And, uh, actually, later we know there is another female student died of poison gas, not of tank attack, mm -hmm. poison gas. So she was fainting, and uh, Fang Zheng was carrying her. And he saw the tank coming. He pushed her out of dangerous way, and he was crushed. He lost both of his legs. Uh, and this uh, was uh, pictured by uh, French uh, journalists, and, and so uh, we still have the picture today. Uh, and after um, the, the students survived, the, uh, the, the, the girl who survived never saw him again. He actually actually denied being there uh, and uh, for everyone who survives the tank attack with uh, injury they were required to cooperate lie about the tank attack so if you mention tank uh, you will not pass this test this requirement and the function from what we know is probably the only one to stay to the truth and say, you know, this I was crushed by attack. There's no other way. It's also worth mentioning just one sentence. He's an athletic student. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and uh, so, you know, the fact that if we couldn't be here today, there is a very deep story uh, I and mean, a very sad background there. Uh, he just uh, realized uh, that before it came, he came. He was bleeding nonstop. Uh, and, For two weeks now. Yeah, and why? Because uh, uh, he's suffering from hepatitis C. Uh, how he caught it? This was from 30 years ago. Uh, the blood infusion. The, the, the uh, contaminated blood transfusion. And uh, he told us most of those who were wounded got hepatitis C that way. Yeah, in fact, two weeks ago, Zhang Jian who was 18 back then and 48, died suddenly. 
suspect, we suspect that's from the complication of uh, hepatitis C. So there's a hepatitis C outbreak uh, among you, Are you suggesting that was intentional? The government did that intentionally? Was that an uh, no, no, we have no proof that's intentional. But uh, uh, that's the result anyway. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's the result of the massacre. Probably, but Fang Zhong was telling me probably the doctors uh, back then did not know hepatitis C had ever existed. Uh, they knew about hepatitis A and B. I need to ask you quickly about the war you've been fighting. Uh, I understand from Rose that, that agents come into your lives, uh, your phone calls are intercepted, your Gmail accounts get hacked. Uh, is, this, is the Chinese government doing that with all the survivors from Tiananmen Square who left the country are now living all over the world? Is, that, is there a global war going on between the government and survivors? Uh, that's true. Uh, I think uh, um, I'm really grateful. Uh, you know, Rose uh, is here today I, I, because uh, it took her 25 years. Uh, so a lot of the survivors uh, today are afraid to talk. That's a fact. Uh, it, you know, I actually met the other survivor of the attack, attack by chance when I was in Texas, and. Uh, I was just so happy because we were looking for him all over. You know, for 20 years we were looking for him and we found him. But uh, you know, I, I, then I realized he's not answering my call anymore. Yeah, he's reluctant. Why? Because he has kept silent so long. He's, he, uh, he's in the uh, United States now. And uh, uh, he's trying to put a lid on it. It just uh, takes so much effort for anyone to come out. You can feel the government's pressure on you even while you're in the United States. Right. And for me personally, uh, I was beaten in a year. Uh, you were in prison. We spent a year in prison. Right. And I'm still talking about the current situation. I, I was beaten a few times in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, year 2008, I, we were beaten by Chinese supporters of the Olympic torch while San Francisco police were watching. So I, I, said, I asked the police, said, do you need this place to, you know, the Chinese uh, consulate exclusively so that the, uh, you know, nobody else can come? He said, no, you know, use your food. So, we are here, you can't beat us. You have to protect. The police just shrugged. So, and even worse, the next day, I called everyone I knew. At that time, I had probably didn't know many journalists. I called Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Nobody wanted to report this. And one of my friends, who was 60 years old, was beaten on the head, was bleeding. You know, it could be fatal. And this was in San Francisco. So uh, about a handful of us, of us were protesting at the wrong spot. We were flooded. We were surrounded by supporters. So there were over a hundred thousand of supporters of Chinese government in San Francisco in that narrow space. And uh, you know they were chanting. They were having you know. It was in a way. It, it, it's, it's like cultural revolution or something else. But uh, yeah, these people, they are professional students. These are institutions. Uh, professional law students, you know, church goers, engineers, high, high paying people. But they were like wolves. When I look at their eyes, you know, when they were beating us, they were driven by pure hatred. And there is such a hatred and a despair in their eyes. It's so shocking. You represent evil. You're evil. Right. That's that's when I when I realized. I said, you know, this is evil. I, I wouldn't stand back. I said, you know, I don't hate you. Uh, but uh, you, you, you are my brother, sister. So that's the situation we are facing now, uh, today, in the United States, as the survivors. That's that's why journalists are so important. Uh, because uh, such our voice always been so. We have time for a couple of questions. So go to that microphone, stand there. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, 
Thank you. So, uh, to me, in the last 30 years, uh, it's a learning process for me. Uh, even as a survivor, I was there. I didn't witness the attack, right? because I was the last to leave Tiananmen Square. I was behind the group that was attacked. And only later, when I met Fang Zhe, I know the scope of this tragedy. But over the years, you know, I met so many people who were there to talk about it, a lot of detail emerged. So first, it's definitely poisonous gas. It's not tear gas. Uh, it, it tastes, it looks, it feels completely different. And uh, later, a lot of people suffer from lung problems. Who was it? Uh, this was definitely poisonous gas. It's not tear gas, because I smelled tear gas the day before, in the evening of June 3rd. Right? And most people knew that was, what that was. So the next is poisonous gas. Uh, another detail emerged that, uh, so before the tank reached this group, they were going full speed from the uh, uh, square on China Street. There were groups before that. We never know what happened to these people who were there. So I, 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 uh, I met a, a Tsinghua student. Uh, you know, for years, he has been blaming himself for causing the tank attack. And uh, his idea was that, uh, so he was almost with, with me, but then he took a shortcut. So he went back on Chang'an Street before the the big uh, group, and there he saw two people wounded on the street. So one is Wang Nai, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, soldiers wouldn't allow the medical staff to reach them. So he was so angry, he you know, burst out in a fascist order, and uh, people begin to gather. So this was closer to the Tiananmen Square, where the troops have uh, occupied. And uh, so as they were gathering, the tents just came out. But uh, so he, he ran. And uh, he, never, he didn't know what happened to the other. And the, because there were people uh, sitting on the street. Uh, so that's probably, yeah. When may I add, uh, most of the killings uh, occurred uh, for miles long uh, along this Chang'anjie. Ironically, the name of Chang'anjie is <laughs> Avenue of Eternal Peace. And this mini massacre, we call it Liu Buko massacre, 11 people died. One got poisoned to death, uh, the other 10, perhaps more, uh, were crushed to death. Yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the student who, that I know uh, her name, Hong Ji Fang, she is yeah, she's from uh, uh, 
Beijing Business College, Yantai. Yeah, yes. So, uh, and the Fangren's story uh, is important also because uh, he survived, and uh, he is a living proof that uh, people's spirit will not be crushed by tank. Uh, it's such an inspiration for everyone uh, who meet him. So this is uh, what we are looking at. You know, it's, it's a tragedy. And the last question from our Tibetan representative. Uh, my name is Tendor, I'm from Tibet Action Institute, and I'm also a student at Columbia University. Um, I, one of my classmates is a member of the uh, CCP, and he said to me when he was a little buzzed at a party one time, he said, <laughs> you know, there's no doubt that China will become a democracy eventually. Um, don't worry about that. And I said, look, okay, how much, he said, like, we just need time. I said, how much time do you need? He said, just 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this, there's this theory, like, I mean, the observation made by many people who uh, watch revolutions have been all over the world, that, like, if you look at the history of revolutions, there's this pattern where every 20, 30 years, uh, in the same spot where a revolution may have failed previously, uh, revolutions have a way of like, regenerating their energies every 20, 30 years when you have a new generation of people come up, you know. And you see the same pattern in Tibet, 1987, 2008. You see the same thing in Burma, 1988, 2007, uh, in Xinjiang, in Egypt. Many places, you like you know, see the same thing happening. Uh, it's not a rule or a law, but it's, there's this pattern, right? So if you look at China in, in your personal observation these days, when you interact with Chinese, who are in their 20s now, uh, what kind of feeling do you get? Do you see any kind of energy coming up, or is it just all this energy is still being suppressed by uh, distractions of social media or whatnot? No, no. Uh, uh, I think the uh, situation now is really, uh, as there's no chance for uh, being uh, optimistic now. Uh, and uh, the uh, younger generation today, they grow under the shadow of the firewall, the, the so-called the Great Firewall. Uh, so you know, every word they talk, you know, the way they behave, uh, in a way they are all programmed uh, to, to, to do, for example, you know, the, the response to your question on TNN. You know, they wouldn't pass a Turing test. Let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's true. If, if you think about it, I, I it's offset. Offset that is. This. No, 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 let me finish. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in my university, uh, just recently, a student proudly posted something about reporting a professor. Uh, and, uh, you know, this kind of reporting probably happened before, but now it's so wide, widely accepted that, uh, you know, the student is talking about it in public, and uh, you know, it's something that uh, he's proud of. That's the situation now. Uh, and uh, you know, talking with some, I think earlier panel people mentioned about Xi Jinping being a surprise. To me, it's no surprise at all. You know, if you allow such a regime to exist, that's the path it's going. Xi Jinping just accelerated in the in the. In, you know, he gathered speed, but the direction was set 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Rose, final okay. word, and Wu Hashi, just final quick summary. What, what, what is your vision of the future of Chinese society? Thank you, Tim Dollar, uh, for speaking up. Uh, the Tiananmen massacre actually started in Asa, Lhasa that year. Massacres uh, started way before in uh, 1989. But let's talk about 89. It started in March in Lhasa, uh, the crackdown on the brave Tibetan protesters. Uh, I am a born optimist. We lived through the darkest times in the Cultural Revolution. We grew up in the Cultural Revolution. That was darker then, and now it's a repeat of the Cultural Revolution. As I said before, this is a very dangerous and exciting time around the world. And now more people who did not care or did not know much about China now are asking us about Tiananmen because they realize Tiananmen massacre could happen anytime, anywhere. They feel more or more Americans and more Europeans feel more related. And, and speaking of the young Chinese students, I get approached by Chinese students all the time. Like uh, I'm hosting a concert tomorrow. We will be there. I invited some Chinese students who were studying in New York 
And I, I wrote very long texts explaining this will be dangerous for you, but you don't have to come, uh, blah, blah, blah. They all said yes. And some of them are in the audience, and they're going to volunteer in the concert tomorrow. And you are all welcome. Uh, they all want to know the truth. Uh, the thing is, let's not overestimate the power of the Chinese Communist Party. The incredibly uh, afraid of people power. They are afraid of us. That's why they're trying to erase us forever. And 30 years later, we're here alive and kicking. And uh, <laughs> all of you uh, who care about us. And also um, the young Chinese, uh, only very few are met. They told some party lines. But all the Chinese I met over the years in my trips when I was able to go back, they, their biggest desire is to send their kids, their family members out of China. And they were saying, oh, forget about me. I'm finished and China is finished. And you no, know, my desire is for my children to grow up in the West. How sad is, is that? 1.4 billion people trying to get out of our country, including the top CCP leaders, including the the, the grassroots are Chinese officials. <laughs> just give, me, give, me, give me one minute. Yeah, uh, I, this panel is labeled as uh, I, I'm going to be on the next panel to answer more questions. But then this panel is labeled as uh, survivors. So three of us are survivors. Think about it. The term it's a very accurate term because I have been living with the survivors guilt for the last 30 years. And then I'm pretty sure I will live through my life carrying that guilt. Uh, but we managed to survive for uh, for different reasons because we did start a business. Its business is still unfinished, and I, 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 we had the support of the world at that time. We still expect that. And then also, in a personal note, I managed to survive because of people like uh, Li Zhuoyan, Martin Lee. Here, I want to. I think it's very important to recognize Hong Kong people's support back in 1989. And then earlier, I uh, mentioned uh, my friend uh, Zheng Xiguang. Right here. This is the 10 Tiananmen student leader back in, and a, a good friend of mine in the square. And then he just met, he lived in China in the last 30 years, just managed to come out. And then I'm trying to urge him to stay, don't go back. You know, free, you have, you deserve to uh, breathe more free air. And then Zheng Xiguang, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. <laughs> He's also on the list, number nine in the world. And then uh, oh, one, one last word, sorry, just not. If we do not stop the creeping of the Chinese Communist Party, we will, the whole world, will facing a problem of surviving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.